Okay, um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Jay Tharapel. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Sydney University. Up until recently, Tim Anderson was my supervisor until, of course, the, the horrible decision to, to get rid of him, which, meant, which means that I've, I've lost someone who, who shared a lot of my ideas, especially with regards to the wars that we've seen in the 21st century so far. So that's what my, my research is about. I'm, I'm looking at trying to arrive at a theoretical explanation for the wars of the 21st century that followed and were often justified by the 9-11 attacks. So first there was the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. Uh, then the invasion of Iraq in 2003. The invasion of Libya in 2011, which a lot of the left supported, by the way. Um, and then, of course, you've got the destabilization of the Syrian government in the attempt to overthrow that government, which began in 2011. Um, that war then spread into, uh, into Iraq as well. And the latest of these wars in the Middle East has been the one that began, that began in Yemen. Um, actually, two days ago um, marks, the fifth, uh, marks the anniversary of the war starting. So, two days ago, on the, uh, on the 26th of March, um, uh, 25th, sorry. on the 26th of March 2015 is when the, when the Saudi uh, coalition began their operations in Yemen. So that will be the focus of the conversation, but I've noticed that you can't really have a conversation about Yemen without going back into history, at least back to about the period of World War I to fully understand the, the nuances of this conflict. Um, <clears throat> so moving on, uh, I'm going to be telling you, um, what I'm going to be telling you is going to be from a perspective that you haven't really heard about in the media. Often in the media what they will say is that Saudi Arabia is acting on behalf of the legitimate government of Yemen, uh, they're acting to, um, to defend this government against Houthi rebels. And often they'll say that these rebels are, are Iranian-backed Houthi rebels, but they, what they won't mention is that the, um, the so-called Houthi rebels are just a militia. In fact, the Houthis themselves are just a tribe in Yemen. Um, the actual body of armed uh, soldiers that are defending the, the, the government that's often associated with just the Houthis is actually the National Salvation Government in Yemen, and they are based in the capital city, Sana'a. So, um, recently, in, in December, uh, an organization was founded, it's called the International Solidarity Committee with Yemen, and it's connected to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, for the Republic of Yemen. Um, we have um, uh, contacts in the National Salvation Government, including um, uh, <coughs> a member from the, from the uh, someone from the Foreign Ministry as well, his name is there, his name is uh, Khaled al -Yesh. and. Um, <clears throat> Our goals are both political and charitable. So on the one hand, uh, charity is extremely important. This country is suffering. Aid, shipment, aid shipments need to get there in order to supply the, uh, the, the population. And of course, even if, even if they have UN food truck written on them, the Saudis will still bomb them. Um, the other issue is, uh, is our other aim is also political. In the sense that we encourage the international community to recognize the National Salvation Government based in the capital Sana'a as the legitimate representative of the Yemeni people for reasons that I'll, that I'll explain uh, over the course of this talk. Um, this, is, uh, this is just an interesting photo from Yemen. So you'll see the, um, uh, the name that's written there, there is Rune Agarhus. He's the guy that started uh, the International Solidarity Committee with Yemen. Uh, he's also the, the guy who started uh, Yemen Resistance Watch, which is a Facebook page that covers the conflict in detail. Um, he's very well known in Yemen, so usually at protests, you know, you'll see photos come up where it says, Rune Agarhus, you know, thank you for standing with Yemen. So um, I just wanted to show my appreciation to him, even though I've never met him. Um, he lives all the way in Denmark, and he's only 20 years old as well. <clears throat> the humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Um, today in Yemen, nearly 13 million people are currently starving out of a total population of 27 million people. That's 48% of Yemen is currently starving. And according to the United Nations humanitarian coordinator, Lisa Grant, 
Um, this means that you know when this war finally ends and a census is taken, we might actually come to the uh, uh, to the conclusion that Yemen's population has shrunk considerably as a consequence of this war. So we could be talking about many millions of people who have died, and we have unfortunately we have no real um, recognition of that in the media. Yes. Is it true that the eighty-five thousand children have died since two thousand and fifteen? Yes, according to the UN. Um, uh, what what the uh, UN humanitarian coordinator for Yemen um, also says is that this could be the worst famine in a hundred years. Um, so that's the gravity of the situation. And what really kind of upset me was that even I didn't feel like I was doing enough for Yemen. And then I looked back at history, and then it started to make sense because. When the British were occupying India, there were famines. 48 million Indians died in famines. India was looted of 45 trillion. And the attitude in the West was mainly one of not even knowing that it was happening. You know? and, I, and, and I hate to see history repeating itself, but unfortunately, history does repeat itself. But these days, we, because we have social media, new methods of communication, there are ways of ameliorating the situation at the very least, so I would encourage you, if you can, if you're able to give to charity, there's, there's an organization called WFA.org. Um, I went to one of their lunches um, earlier on this year. They managed to raise something like three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars uh, just off two lunches, both in Sydney and Melbourne, so they're doing fantastic work. Um, why are uh, Yemenis starving? Um, the, the reason, I'm sure, is obvious to most of you. The reason is because Saudi Arabia imposes a naval blockade on Yemen, which is starving a nation that even prior to this war was one of the poorest countries in the world. And even before the war, it relied on food aid for 90% of its... 90% um, of its food came in, in the form of imports. So not, not um, food aid, it's just 90%, just in normal circumstances, of all of the food in Yemen came through imports. And the Saudis, by blockading the ports, are actually are preventing that food from entering, which is what's causing the mass starvation. Um, I'd also say that this is possibly the most cowardly war that I've ever seen. I mean, I thought the Iraq, the invasion of Iraq was pretty cowardly. You sanction a country for 10 years, and then you invade it, and then you act like you're some big, some big conquerors and heroes. Um, but in the case of Yemen, you're talking about aggression carried out by 20 countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are joined by Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait, Bahrain, Morocco, Senegal, Sudan. Um, the coalition is armed by the United States, Britain, Canada, and Australia. And I'm going to be talking about that towards the, the later part of this presentation. But they're also supplied by Malaysia, Brazil, Finland, Bosnia, Eritrea, France, and Germany. In other words, this is, this is a way for countries to make a quick buck because they can sell military equipment to the Saudis. And often they can sell their specialists because the Saudis often don't know how to use that military equipment because... They're Saudis. <laughs> I'll get to that later. Um, but I mean, one of the one of the most uh, uh, extraordinary stories was from uh, was from 2016 when, you know, the the Saudis they've got all of this all of this technology, all of these gadgets, all of these all, all of this the, the equipment of war, you know, um, to try and block missiles from coming in. And the Yemen the Yemenis these these broke starving you know peasants wearing wearing flip flops and just armed with, like, you know, uh, mostly with just small arms, managed to build a missile. But they shot one missile in the direction of Saudi Arabia. The Saudis claimed that they were trying to hit Mecca. And then they, they got all of their, their supporters and uh, around the world to start tweeting and issuing statements of solidarity with the poor victimized kingdom of Saudi Arabia, <laughs> even though they're starving 48% of the Yemen population. Moving on, how the war is framed. So I mentioned this before. So the official justification is that Saudi Arabia is acting on behalf of the officially recognized government of Yemen, headed by the President Abdurrahman Mansour Hadi, against the Iranian-backed Houthi rebellion. That is the official justification. And what I've noticed is that even in our media, even if they criticize the Saudis for causing mass death and destruction, they will still frame it in this way. You know. So I've, I've included a quote by um, you know, the Saudi Director of General Intelligence, and he says something very similar. He even says, um, so the, they had to request, this is the, 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 the Hadi government, had to request the support of their closest brother country, Saudi Arabia, you know, to launch this aggression. Of course, what, what's not mentioned there is that Saudi Arabia is actually bombing Yemen on behalf 
of what they claim is the legitimate president of Yemen, but that president of Yemen they've kept under house arrest in Riyadh. Okay, so that's like, to give you an example with Syria, which, are, which is a conflict a lot of people are familiar with, that would be a bit like if, um, if Iran uh, kept Bashar al-Assad <laughs> um, under house arrest in Tehran, or if Putin kept um, uh, Bashar al-Assad under house arrest in Moscow while claiming to act on his behalf. That's the, that's the absurdity of the situation, and yet, if you look at the media, they will very diligently say, yes, Saudi Arabia is acting on behalf of the officially recognized government. This is just an example, so, from Mashable Australia, you know, um, they say, Saudi-led coalition targeting rebel positions, you know, so that's no mention of the National Salvation Government, just rebel positions, Shiite Houthi rebels, it always helps to say Shiites, you know, because it's a way of linking them to Iran, because Yemenis have no agency, they're just puppets, you know. Uh, Yemen is often treated as just a, um, an empty vessel, you know. Um, and both Saudi Arabia and Iran are pouring in weapons, you know, to each side. Yemenis are afforded no agency, and that's something that you see whenever imperialist wars of aggression are conducted these days. The actual people aren't afforded any agency, you know. So, you see down there, um, the one on the right, proxy war between regional rivals Saudi Arabia and Iran, exactly the same kind of framing. Um, and of course, at the top, it's, it says that fuel being shipped um, to, to, to Yemen is illegal. I don't know where they got that from, right? That it's illegal to send fuel to a country. Um, and of course, it's going to the Houthi Shiite rebels. Again, scary language, Iran, that kind of thing. Um, why is Yemen so important? Now, if you have a look at this map, this is a map of, uh, of, of, of trade. So these are the naval um, routes that are, that are the most traveled. And if you look at where Yemen is, that is what's known as an entrepot in geographic, uh, geographic language. So something like, I think it's the fourth busiest shipping lane for oil in the world. So a lot of the world's oil would, would travel from Saudi Arabia through that very narrow strait, which is only about 20 kilometers, all the way around India, would go to, to China, would be a huge supplier. And what's happening, like, and, and you really have to have an appreciation of how much the world has changed. Um, for most of human history, and I don't say this just because I'm Indian, I mean, for most of human history, India and China represented something like 60% of the world's GDP. Now, today, the global center of gravity is moving back towards the east. It's moving back especially towards China. So for a country like Saudi Arabia to maintain control over Yemen is an extremely important strategic uh, imperative. So what that means is that they cannot allow Yemen to become an independent country. Yemen's allowed to become an independent country with its own navy, self-defining, etc. Then it means that Yemen might be able to have more of a say in terms of how Saudi Arabia conducts itself. If Saudi Arabia, for example, as they have done, arms and supports terrorist groups across the Middle East, in Libya, Syria, and Iraq, then Yemen can say, well, hang on, if you keep doing that, if you keep destabilizing the region, then we're going to have to impose a blockade. That might actually force Saudi Arabia to behave itself. And so these are some of the, the broader reasons I want you to start thinking about why there is a, a war in Yemen. Um, moving on. <clears throat> Yemen has a long history of uh, facing off um, foreign, foreign conquerors. So I often like to say that um, oftentimes the media will will present these conflicts as religious conflicts, so Sunni, Shiite, you know, Christian, Muslim, things like that. But if you look at it throughout history, I mean, ideology or religion is, is little more than just the clothing the geopolitical conflicts wear over time. So over time, you know, you see the same conflicts playing themselves out over and over again, you know. So Yemen, um, uh, at one point in, in history, was actually being uh, competed over between two different rival superpower um, superpowers of the time. You had the, the Byzantine Empire on the one side and the Persians on the other side, right? The Byzantines were in alliance with the Aksumites, which, which is in Ethiopia. And um, this actually relates to Islamic history because before Islam, Yemen, and a lot of people don't know this and are, and are often surprised when they hear it, Yemen was actually a Jewish kingdom. You know, it was ruled by the Himyarite dynasty. Um, and they converted to Judaism sometime around the 4th century. Um, and as often happens, over time, dynasties become corrupt, they become unjust, you know, um, uh, and, and Yemen was exactly the same. So, in opposition to the growing, corrupt, unjust Himyarite dynasty, there was a growing Christian movement, right? 
And this is mentioned in the Quran in um, Surat al baruj You can't remember? Okay. <laughs> I believe it's Surat al baruj It was a growing Christian movement. So what the last uh, Himyarite king of Yemen did was he had them burnt in a massive ditch. This then triggered uh, an invasion from the kingdom of, of, of Aksum. And then the, the Persians were called in to defeat the kingdom of Aksum. And it remained under Persian control from under Persian control from 570 to 630 when Yemen finally embraced Islam. And then Yemen became one of the, the, the main reasons why Islam spread so rapidly across the world. So I'm from uh, a place in India called Kerala. Now a lot of people don't know this, but Kerala actually had Islam before Mecca did. You know, so we had our first mosque in uh, 629 AD. And the reason for that is because of Yemeni merchants. You know, Yemeni merchants who had a long history of trade with Kerala. I mean, if you have a look at that map that I showed you before, um, Kerala is, is, is right there at the southern tip of India, right? So it's like, that's, that's where I'm from, right? So Yemen, Kerala, it's, it's one of the most busiest traveled um, uh, routes in history. That's why something like 60% of Kerala's Muslim population have some Yemeni ancestry. Um, so very, very important trade route. Um, so yeah, I mean, Yemen, Yemen uh, uh, really embraced Islam. It became um, a major part of their identity from there on in. Um, but, ever, but just because they embraced Islam doesn't mean they're not going to see Islamic powers as foreign conquerors, which they did. So um, when, uh, who's, who's heard of Salah bin Ayyubi? Okay, not one person back there. Um, he's often known as, as the, the liberator of Jerusalem from, from, the, from the Crusaders. But Saladin. To, uh, Saladin, yeah. Saladin, yeah. Saladin, yeah. Saladin, yeah. Saladin <laughs> So, um, but you know, uh, Ayubi, uh, Salah al-Din Ayubi, ruling from Damascus at the time, uh, conquered Yemen, as absorbed it into the Ayyubid Sultanate for the, for the exact same reason that the previous uh, uh, empires, Byzantine and um, the, the Byzantines and the Persians, wanted to control Yemen because of its strategic position. Okay, so before World War I, um, how are we going? Okay, so um, before World War I, uh, Yemen was occupied by two empires, you know, so this was the period in, 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 in history when if you look at the map of the world, um, look at a map of the world, you just see empires, you know, dominating everywhere. So the British controlled most of the planet, they controlled India. It was just empires fighting against each other. Um, so in that period of just global empire, um, Yemen was basically divided and controlled by two different occupying powers, the Ottomans and the British. Now, the Ottomans actually began invading and occupying uh, Yemen because the Portuguese had managed to circumnavigate all the way around Africa and they were vying for control over Yemen as well. So in order to counter the, the, the Portuguese, uh, who, by the way, from, from, uh, from the point of view of South India, they, the Portuguese were basically just Catholic terrorists, you know, went around uh, sinking ships. So, for example, a ship from Kerala going to Yemen on the way to Mecca in the, in the year 1500 was, was sunk. Um, killing 500 people because that was the Portuguese way of basically ruling the waves and saying these trade routes, these strategic points of interest, we control them. Um, so because the Portuguese started to take over those regions, the Ottomans started to push push in as well. You know, um, so they started to take over parts of Yemen, and the Ottomans were actually uh, they initially uh, described Yemen as a land with no lord, an empty province. It would not only be possible but easy to recapture and should it be captured, it would be the master of the lands of India and send every year a great amount of gold and jewels to Constantinople. Yeah, completely wrong. Um, <laughs> they sent 70,000 um, uh, troops to Yemen in the 16th century, only 7,000 returned. And I would encourage you to read an article by Gary Brecher, um, AKA the Warner, he wrote it in 2015. It's called A Brief History of the Yemen Cluster F, but it's a great article, um, expletives aside. Moving on. North Yemen. So a lot of people don't know this. Um, in the southern part of Saudi Arabia, the provinces of Baha, Asir, Jizan, and Najran are historically Yemeni territories. They should be treated just as much as occupied territories of Yemen, as the West Bank is, is an occupied territory. West Bank and Gaza are the occupied territories of Palestine. Or just as Palestine is occupied by a foreign entity like Israel. Um, but, but it's not, and, and I'll get to that later. A lot of it has to do with the fact that, um, unfortunately, and I say this, 
A lot of the Muslim world have been bought by Saudi influence. I mean, it's not a popular thing to say, but unfortunately it's true. So the Saudis, um, uh, the, the 20th century was terrible for you, put it that way. Um, I mean, the previous centuries they've been ground down and, and oppressed under the Ottomans, of course, but, um, but the 20th century was particularly bad because when the, uh, when the Ottomans were defeated um, by the British, and the British, of course, supported the Arab revolt against the Ottomans, um, it left a power vacuum, and who filled that power vacuum of the Ottomans being defeated? I already mentioned one, so Israel filled the power vacuum, I mean, they, Palestine was essentially sold to them. The other major country that filled that power vacuum won and came to power because of British patronage was, of course, Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia the, the originally comes from a place called the Nejd. Nejd is actually in the center of Arabia. So, it's actually historically a landlocked place. They didn't do a lot of trade. It's not the most cosmopolitan place in the world. Um, you know, the, the, the tropes and the stereotypes about Saudi Arabia, to a certain extent, are true. They were basically hacking each other's heads off in the middle of the desert, and then they struck oil, and then because of British patronage, they were able to take over large parts of Arabia. In fact, they wanted to take over the entirety of Yemen, and they failed. They were, they were stopped in their tracks under the leadership of Imam Yahya Hamid al-Din, and he was the... Uh, the Imam of Yemen at that time, because Yemen, ever since about like the 9th century, has been the, the highlands of Yemen, the, the parts of Yemen that are now dominated by the Houthis. Um, uh, those uh, areas uh, uh, <coughs> from the 9th century onwards were controlled by the Imamate of Yemen, so a, her a hereditary Zaydi Imamate. And I'll get into what, what the Zaydis are later. Um, so they were forced to cede uh, the green parts of their country to the Saudis, and they were able to keep the red parts, which is now the modern border between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Um, now, then what happened is that in, Imam Yahya was very well liked, he was popular, um, but his successors, remember, hereditary system, there's a tendency for, for monarchies in any system of government to become corrupt over time, um, his successors weren't as good, they weren't liked, they were brutal, they were oppressive, and so there was a coup, a republican coup, supported by Egypt, uh, against the Imamate, um, which is why you see the flag of North Yemen go from being the, the sword, if you see the one, if you see under the 1967-60, I'll, I'll use the laser pointer, I just realised that. Um, yeah, so that's like the, the, the flag of Yemen then, there was a coup, and so Yemen kind of fell in line with, uh, with the, the Arab nationalist, um, uh, the, the style of having red, white, and black, and like a green style. It's very similar to the Syrian flag. This was a civil war in which uh, Egypt sent 70,000 troops to help um, the, the Republicans beat back the Royalists. And this is what I mean about saying that like the framing of Sunni versus Shia doesn't make any sense if you look at this particular history, because in that conflict, the, the Saudis, actually supported the, the Zaydi Imame, even though the Zaydis are, you know, at least referred to uh, mainly as a Shiite, you know, um, religion, right? But in a sense, they're not, because the Zaydis are the, the Sunnis of the Shia and the Shia of the Sunnis. I'll get into that later. Um, but ultimately, the, um, the Republicans managed to win, and that's like, that, that's where the, the, the modern North Yemeni state comes from, right? The, the victory of the Republicans. Um, <clears throat> South Yemen, because it was occupied by the British, it has a different history. So, um, uh, <clears throat> South Yemen in 1967, the Yemeni communists managed to liberate their country uh, from British colonial occupation. Um, but they also had their own internal struggles, because you had, for example, one faction that wanted to export the revolution to other Arab countries, and you had, you had another faction that didn't want to, that just wanted to kind of keep to themselves. Um, and I'll mention that later because it, it ties into the later development of the conflict. Um, this is a major event in, in North Yemeni history um, that's often underappreciated. So there was a Republican revolution in, in um, 1962. Uh, by 67, the Republicans had consolidated, they had won, the Imame had been defeated. Um, and in 1974, there was a coup d'etat, as often happens in Republican governments. I mean, Syria had many coups, Iraq had many coups. Um, Yemen was no different. So in 74 there was a coup by a by someone who became one of Yemen's best presidents in hindsight, you know, modernizer. Um, his name was President Ibrahim al-Hamdi. And he um, 
his main thing was that he was against tribalism. He was against tribal affiliations. He wanted to create a modern state. And he was also in favor of, of reconnecting with South Yemen and developing strong ties with them. And so that's why um, uh, his assassination is, is often attributed to the, the intrigue of Saudi Arabia. That Saudi Arabia was behind his, uh, his assassination. And after he was assassinated, it paved the way for like 34 years of, of uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh who's the president who was, uh, who was toppled in 2012. So 34 years under Ali Abdullah Saleh, what happened? Wahhabi and Saudi influence grew rapidly in Yemen. And you got to remember that after 78, we're heading into the 1980s. This is a period when, when there's a jihad, a so-called jihad happening in Afghanistan, where Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, the CIA, um, they are arming and funding the various uh, militias that are waging war against the Afghan government which at that time was being defended by the Soviet Union. So part of, the, part of the benefit for Saudi Arabia of keeping a country like Yemen poor and backward is that you've got a lot of desperate young men. You know? And so if the Saudis can, you know, in the 1980s, recruit from among this population, then they're able to have soldiers, foot soldiers, for their so-called jihad in Afghanistan. And so Yemen became a major recruiting ground in the 1980s, and that's ultimately what brought al-Qaeda to Yemen. It's actually the policies of the United States. Um, not, not talked about, but it's true. Um, uh, since we're strapped for time, I'll, I'll leave out the, the 78 to 82 civil war. Suffice it to say that the, the growing Islamization, um, um, or Salafiization, Wahhabization of North Yemen uh, uh, resulted in, um, in, in a response. So uh, the, the South Yemeni government would actually support the NDF, that's the national... Um, uh, democratic forces, and they, they were socialists, essentially. And they were like, there, was, there was a period of internal civil war for four years, which the, the, North was eventually, the North eventually won. Now, in order to understand the, the kind of... Uh, the big, the, the major, the, the struggle between the, the Saudi Wahhabis and the Yemenis 80s, we really have to go back into Islamic history. And this is just going to be a very, I'm not going to go into this too much. Um, uh, and and I, just, I just intend on giving you an idea of where these ideologies themselves come from. Because, you know, uh, Marx said that the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle. And I think the history of religion is something similar, in the sense that you can't just look at Islam and understand Islam as one monolithic thing. You have to understand Islam as uh, a set of uh, you know, competing... Uh, there's, there's definitely a fracture in Islam between different interests, you know, so the interests of one class will end up embodying one particular type of Islam. The, the, the interests of another class will embody another type of Islam, and I think that really comes through in the dichotomy between Wahhabism and Zaydism. So, just to give you a rundown of Islamic history, there was a... Um, after the uh, death of the Prophet Muhammad, there was a succession of four caliphs that came to power. Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali. Now, Abu Bakr, that was a period of consolidation. Then under Omar, there was expansion. So that's when the Muslims defeated Rome and Persia. Then under Uthman, you started to see corruption, decadence build into the system. It's, it's been a theme of my talk, as you can tell. And, the, and then what happened is that after Uthman was, was assassinated, a lot of the people went to Ali. Ali is the cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet Muhammad. Because he was, a, he, was, he was popular, he had won. He played a major role in, in winning the decisive battles, military battles in the history of early Islam, when Islam was under threat and being attacked. Um, but, and what I find interesting is that, um, is that you know, at that time, uh, Ali's period of, of time was a period of reform, but also a period of civil war. There were three civil wars against him. And if you read Naj al which is a very important book to the Shia Muslims, they mention that Ali was actually warned by one of his own officials. They said, look, my master, there are reasons why the influential and rich Arabs are deserting you and gathering around your enemy, and that enemy would become the Umayyad, uh, Udma, um, Umayyad dynasty, which was founded after the assassination of Ali. So after, after Ali is assassinated, right? so um, people's champion, pro-poor pro kind of uh, leader, I mean, you can look at it in that kind of way if you want to inject a class analysis into it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, <laughs> anyway, so then, then, um, so, so what happened is that after Ali was assassinated, um, power went from uh, power went into the hands of the Umayyad family, and the Umayyad family developed a reputation for extreme corruption, extreme brutality. Um, uh, but at the same time, it also built a really impressive empire. So if you look up on the left-hand side, I mean, it stretched all the way from Spain to India. You know, that's like the, the size of the Soviet Union or something like that, right? <laughs> back in the, um, in the, the 7th and 8th centuries. Um, but ultimately, it, it resulted in something really tragic. Tragic In 680 AD, the Umayyad regime massacred um, Hussein ibn Ali. Hussein is the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. <coughs> Him and his, and his family members were, were murdered at Karbala. And his son survived that massacre. His son is Zayn al Abidin. Zayn al Abidin's son um, is Zayd ibn Ali. And Zayd ibn Ali is who the Zaydis in Yemen are named after. Zaydism is the, um, is the ideology of Ansarullah the Houthis. Um, Zayd, by the way, is, uh, is not a polarizing figure. He's actually respected by Sunnis and Shiites. In fact, his, um, his rebellion was supported by. Abu Hanifa, who is the, who's the, 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 the person who founded the largest school of jurisprudence within Sunni Islam. Um, and then that, and then so Zayd ibn Ali led, led this revolution in 740 AD against the Umayyads. And it wasn't successful. Zayd actually died and he's recognized as a martyr and a shaheed by most Muslims. Um, but the uh, Umayyad dynasty collapsed 10 years later, largely because of the, the inertia of that revolution. And that brought to power the Abbasids. Um, again, another dynasty. They, they came to power with a very kind of pro-Shia, with very pro-Shia rhetoric, but they ended up persecuting the, the Shia Imams uh, just as much as the Umayyads had. Oh. Okay. So Here's one of the, the, the really interesting things that I find in, in the discourse between um, uh, Wahhabism and, and Salafism, which you see represented on the left-hand side and Zaydism on the right-hand side. Wahhabism and Salafism, traditionally, their attitude towards power was one of, you know, don't risk it, be conservative, don't rebel against authority. So Ahmad ibn Hanbal, for example, um, who, or, who founded the Hanbali school, which is the school of, um, of Saudi Arabia, by the way. So Saudi Arabia's school is the Hanbali school. Um, he said, 60 years under a tyrant, better than one night of anarchy. You see something very similar from Ghazali. He said, 60 years of tyranny are better than one hour of civil strife. Under Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Taymiyyah is the polarizing figure. I mean, he, he's the one that a lot of modern Salafis look to for inspiration. Um, so he said, 60 years under an oppressive imam are preferable to one night without a sultan. Um, and then you compare that to the right-hand side, you've got the Zaydis, the, one of the core concepts, one of the core tenets of Zaydism is the concept of khuruj. Now, khuruj implores Muslims to rebel against unjust rulers, right? So it's the complete opposite. On the one hand, it's saying, look, even if the ruler is oppressive, you know, just stay in your place, you know, like, you know, just trust in God, trust in God. Um, or if you believe that the leader has sinned, you know, you should advise them privately, you shouldn't do this revolution stuff. Whereas Khuruj is the exact opposite. It's like, no, unjust rulers have to be rebelled against. That's the Zaydi kind of, the, the defining feature of Zaydism. I must say, though, that on the left-hand side, if I'm going to be fair to that perspective, um, Ibn Taymiyyah was writing in a period when the Mongols were, were, were ripping through the Middle East, committing genocide, depopulating Persia. Um, so that was, a, that was a horrible period. And so in a period like that, it makes sense for someone to say, look, you know, defend the status quo is better than the foreign aggressor, you know? So, spreading Saudi Wahhabism to Yemen. So this, um, uh, this is Juhayman al Odaibi. Now, uh, some of you might be old enough to remember that in 1979, there was an attempt by rebels to overthrow the Saudi government by, by seizing control of the, the, the places of worship, the mosques in, in Saudi Arabia. Now that failed, um, but the Saudis actually uh, accused the, the ringleader of that attempt at seizing the mosque um, uh, of being influenced by the teachings of a, Ye a Yemeni Salafi by the name of Muqbil bin Hadi al wadir And he was of Zaydi heritage originally, you know, but then he went to Saudi Arabia, learned in their schools, and adopted more of a Wahhabi Salafi um, uh, way of looking at the world. 
He argued that the independence of South Yemen from Britain was worse than British colonialism because it resulted in the formation of a socialist government. Okay? That's how far he was willing to go. And you know, it makes sense. I mean, like I showed you the, the map earlier, um, the British and the, the Ottomans, they were, trying to they were trying to divide Yemen amongst themselves. So it made more sense from a Saudi point of view to have the British controlling that area than it to be liberated. You know? Because they trust the British. I mean, they were put in power by the British. Um, but the, the funny thing about, like, uh, about you know, Sunnis and Wahhabis is that, you know, they actually consider the Saudi regime to be illegitimate. But the problem is there's no money in fighting against the Saudi regime. There's money in fighting in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, um, uh, Lebanon, Libya, all of these countries. There's money. Saudis will pay. But there's no money in fighting against the Saudi government inside Saudi Arabia. So, uh, before um, uh, 1990, <coughs> what is this horrible cough? I don't know why. Um, this, is, this is what it looked like, you know, before unification. So, if you're old enough, this is the Yemen that you remember. A north and a south, the south, south being communist, north being Arab nationalist. Or at least nominally, you know, heavily influenced by Saudi Arabia, to the point where the Arab nationalism didn't matter anymore. But now you see these same kind of geographic boundaries um, in the war in Yemen today because the South is increasingly the territory that the UAE is trying to influence and control and the North is the territory that Saudi Arabia is trying to take back um, violently, of course. So, in 1990, Yemen unified. And I think to understand the conflict, you have to also understand the unification of Yemen because it resulted in the socialist South being merged with, with, the, with the North, on the terms of the North. And just like in any other country where like, you know, the socialist government was basically uh, disintegrated, take for example um, East Germany, a lot of its assets were stripped and then there was a lot of corruption. Um, a lot of the wealth of the country ended up being concentrated by the people um, in, in, the, in the government that was allied to the capitalist West, and that was North Yemen. So it's in this period that the, uh, the Yemeni Muslim Brotherhood, the Islah Party, was founded in 1990. And um, in this period, you know, they, there was tension with the Yemeni Socialist Party because they didn't like the unification because of all the privatizations and the economic injustices. Um, they didn't like, for example, that you had northern tribal sheikhs coming to uh, South Yemen and saying, oh, this land belonged to my ancestors, it's been in... in, in belonged to my ancestors 300 years ago and then later on they would find out that that particular piece of land was reclaimed from the sea by the British in the 1950s and it was just outright theft. That's what happened. Um, but it also uh, uh, allowed, because this is like 1990, by 1994 there was a civil war and the big advantage that the, that the government had against the Yemeni socialists was that all of the Yemeni Mujahideen, the fighters who had been fighting in Afghanistan had come back to Yemen. They come back to Yemen and they turn their guns on the socialists. Well, because we fought socialists in Afghanistan, let's fight the socialists in South Yemen as well. So, I mean, uh, the, the leader of the southern movement, Ali Salim and Bey, uh, estimates that, you know, several hundred southern communist officials were killed in that period. <clears throat> so, the 1993 elections, um, the Yemeni Socialist Party did quite well. They won 56 seats, you know, which is pretty good when you consider that the southern part of Yemen, mind you, the southern part of Yemen has about 18% of the population. The northern part has, has the majority, has 82% of the population. So, for elections, for, in, in those kind of elections, for the Yemeni Socialist Party to, to win 56 seats, that was quite impressive, which is why the terrorism against the Yemeni Socialist Party began. And that's when you start to see the real collusion between the, the Yemeni state under Ali Abdullah Saleh and the, uh, the returned Mujahideen. So, for example, one of uh, Saleh's uh, top generals is Ali Muhsin al Ahmad. Now, he's actually married to the sister of the leader of the Yemeni Mujahideen contingent in Afghanistan. Right? Um, <coughs> Abdul Rab Mansur Hadi, who is the president that the Saudis currently claim that they're bombing Yemen on behalf of, he was originally from the south, he left to the north, and he supported the north's war against the south. You know? So he's actually hated in the south, which is why when he um, uh, uh, resigned as president, um, 
back in, uh, back in 2014 when the Houthis took over Sana'a. First he went to Aden, then he realized that he's not safe there because people want to kill him. Um, and then he decides to go to Saudi Arabia and he's been there ever since. I'll get to that later. The six Sa'adaw Wars. So you can't understand Ansar Allah unless you understand what happened in 1994. Um, Ansar Allah, they really emerged as a, as a revivalist movement. They want to revive Zaydism uh, um, in opposition to Wahhabism. Because Wahhabism was the, um, was the dominant trend uh, in Saudi Arabia, it was, the, it was the movement that was growing, especially because of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and all that kind of stuff, and the Saudis pumping lots of money into mosques and things like that. So, um, Hussein al-Houthi uh, started this party called the Haq Party, you know, and they were actually quite sympathetic to the, to the South Yemeni socialists. They spoke out in defense of the South Yemeni socialists, and for that they faced uh, uh, immense repression. Um, <clears throat> so in that period of time, uh, the, known as the, the, the Six Sada Wars, um, it started really in, in, in 2004. Um, from 2004 onwards, the, the Yemeni government started doing something very curious because this was during the war on terror. You know? So during this period, the United States would, um, would, would tell the Yemenis, you have to fight against Al-Qaeda. And the Yemenis would say, yeah, the, the Yemeni government under Ali Abdullah Saleh would say, yes, you know, we're going to fight against Al-Qaeda. And instead of fighting against Al-Qaeda, they'd fight against the Houthis. But the thing is, the Houthis, or Ansar Allah, they never actually tried to overthrow the Yemeni state. You know, they emerged in 1994, they wanted to become a political movement, a revivalist movement. They weren't interested in carrying uh, arms even. They were forced to defend themselves because the Yemeni state went after their leader. And in all likelihood, they went after the... the went after um, uh, Hussein al-Houthi, the leader of Ansar Allah, uh, because the Saudis told them to. The Saudis said, we don't like him, they sound Iranian to us, get rid of him, right? And that's how it goes back there. And the United States went along with it as well. So, most likely, even the United States was cynical enough to understand what was happening. Surely, they would have been. Because, on the one hand, the Yemenis are telling the world we're fighting against Al-Qaeda, but on the other hand, they're using Al-Qaeda foot soldiers to fight against the Houthis um, from 2004 onwards. Yeah. Okay, now we get to the uh, Yemeni Arab Spring protests of 2011. So much like the rest of, like, um, I mean, I use Arab Spring in quotation marks because there's some, there's some confusion over what that, what that really means because when the Arab Spring started in Tunisia, for it to spread from Tunisia to Egypt to Lebanon, it took less than 48 hours. But for the so-called Arab Spring to then spread to other countries like Syria, it took another three or four months. But unlike in, um, in those previous countries in Syria, the so-called Arab Spring began on the border regions, you know, bordering Jordan, bordering Turkey. Whereas the, one, the, the events in, in Lebanon, Tunisia and Egypt all took place in the, the major centers. You know? Well, Yemen was, was an actual Arab Spring protest in the sense that it took place in the major center, it took place in Sana'a. And this was a situation in which it was an anti-incumbent um, protest movement. So, the, so Ansar Allah supported it, uh, Islah supported it, Is, the Islahis are the Muslim Brotherhood. They're the ones that, remember I mentioned before Ali Muhsin and Ahmad, the, um, the uh, war against uh, the Houthis, the Six Sada Wars, right? That was known as Ali Muhsin's War. So this is a war in which Islah and is, uh, 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 a general in the Yemeni army who's a part of Islah was leading the charge, leading the military campaign against Ansar Allah. So anyway, so um, what happens is that initially they crack down hard, but then Ali Muhsin and Ahmad distances himself from the Yemeni president Ali Abdullah Saleh and he, and he starts to claim some kind of solidarity with the protesters. He, he says, I'm going to protect the protesters from, from, from the regime and all that kind of stuff. And it's, and it's true. This actually results in, a, in, in the Saudis entering the picture. And so the Saudis were able to negotiate this deal. And the deal is one in which the president of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who's been in power for 34 years, been very, very loyal to Saudi Arabia, um, very loyal to the United States, he steps aside in favor of Abdurrahman Mansur Hadi. Hadi wins in a one-candidate election. 
and the United States recognizes this as being truly legitimate. No, no, no. Um, in Syria, uh, in 2014, there was a three-candidate election because in Syria they actually changed the constitution. You know? But in Yemen, um, they just went with a one-candidate election the entire world. Nobody questioned the legitimacy of Hadi back then. Nobody questions his legitimacy now, even though he's locked up by Saudi Arabia. And the Saudis are bombing Yemen on his behalf. Um, but anyway, so the Saudis were able to put the Islam party into government. So the next ruling coalition would be, Hadi would be the president, and then it would be the, the former party, which is the GPC, which is a broad tent kind of secular. Like, it, it really meant nothing by the end. Um, they would be in alliance with the Yemeni Muslim Brotherhood. And that was the, the kind of government that Hadi represented. I bring this in, this is one of the kind of pivotal moments in the, in the kind of Houthi awakening, the, the Ansarullah uprising. Um, remember before how I mentioned the six Sada wars. Now, when those wars were being waged against Ansarullah, the government used to recruit Salafi fighters, Wahhabi fighters. And a lot of these fighters would be from, the, uh, from this Dar al Hadith um, uh, uh, center. So it's like a Wahhabi center. It was founded by Muqbil bin Hadi al Wadi, the guy who said that, like, you know, British rule was better than the socialists being in charge of South Yemen. Um, so it was founded by that guy, and it was, it was, it was um, placed right in the middle of the Zaidi heartland, you know, right in the middle. And so that was basically kind of like a training camp for a, lot of the, um, for a lot of the militias that the government would use, because they couldn't trust the army to fight against Ansar Allah, because the army is, just, is often comprised of people who are sympathetic to Ansar Allah, who come from parts of Yemen that um, are heavily influenced by Ansar Allah, so they, could, they had to rely on the Salafi Wahhabi fighters who had been radicalized by ideologues from Saudi Arabia. You know, so uh, this battle um, was, was quite conclusive. Ansarullah demanded that the center hand over all of its weapons. They refused. Fighting ensued for two, for two months. 830 people killed on both sides. But ultimately a decisive victory for Ansarullah. Um, if you watch, there, there are some videos on YouTube where there's like, you know, there's, there's people who are sympathetic to the center, you know, crying and talking about how the Zaydis, like, you know, victimize them in this horrible way. But what they don't mention is that, you know, the, the, that they were doing the victimizing for most of the Sada wars. They were the ones that were joining the government in waging this war against Ansar Allah. Um, okay, so this is a bit about the, uh, the Hadi transitional government. Um, <coughs> So the Southern Movement, uh, which is the Socialists, and, and Ansarullah, what they wanted was for Yemen to be divided into two regions so that the South would get some degree of autonomy again. And, and so you have the North and the South Yemen, but it would be one federal state. Um, but what Hadi wanted to do, and this is where the interests of Saudi Arabia and the oil interests and the moneyed interests of Yemen who support Hadi come into it, they wanted Yemen to be divided into six provinces. Um, which is, you know, the, the federalization of Yemen. And that, that was rejected. Ansarullah completely rejected this and said, you can't do this because you're going to divide Yemen into rich and poor regions. Because if you look at that region in green, Azad, that is actually uh, landlocked, it's resource poor. Um, whereas uh, Shabwa, which is in the Hadramov region, the blue part, is, is resource rich. They've got plenty of gold, they've got plenty of oil. You know, so those regions were able to benefit and other regions would not be able to get, um, would not be able to benefit from that wealth. I mean, that's the kind of federalization. It was something the Saudis wanted. And it was recognized. I mean, independent observers basically said, yes, the idea of developing Yemen into six disproportionate regions with enormous autonomy was a blatant effort to benefit foreign interests. Then, of course, the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back, which, which resulted in hundreds of thousands of people taken to the streets of Sana'a to demand the resignation of uh, the president, Hadi, was when Hadi slashed the, the fuel subsidies because of IMS, IMF pressure, which resulted in, in fuel prices going up by 195%. You know? So you can imagine what that does to an already poor country. You know? um, and that's when Abdel Malik al Houthi, who's the current leader of Ansarullah, he said, if the authorities do not heed our demands until Friday, there are a number of legitimate pressure tactics which resulted in, in more protests in the capital. And, and this has to be mentioned because often it's, um, it's it, people make it seem like the Houthis just like went in there and took over. It's not true. 
um, you know, they, they sat in the public square, they participated in broad-based uh, social movements, um, they participated in this thing called the Change Revolution, um, they did this alongside many members of the Islam as well, you know, even though the Islam uh, pro-Saudi Muslim Brotherhood, their general fought against Ansar Allah, they still participated. There was, a, there was an element of civil discourse happening at the local level. Um, it was only, it was, it was because Hadi had um, been so disappointing in, in heeding to the interests of the IMF, heeding to the interests of, of the Saudis who wanted to federalize the country, that they eventually moved and took over Sana'a. And it was a bloodless coup. I mean, they talk about the, the revolution in Syria, you know, like hundreds of thousands of, of, of people have been killed. I mean, armed insurgents have been rocketing cities for the past seven years. They call that a revolution. Here you had basically hundreds of thousands of people occupying the city, and then the, the government didn't know what to do. I mean, to the point where the government actually um, uh, let them take over, you know. And um, the, the Houthis didn't even ask uh, the president, uh, Hadi, to resign. Um, all they said is that we would like for, for the government to include us, because they'd been, they had been excluded by the Saudi-backed deal, as you'd expect. Um, and actually, President Hadi ordered the Yemeni army to stand down, and, um, and, and the Interior Ministry of Yemen, they declared that Ansarullah are acting in the service of the general interests of the homeland. So even the Interior Ministry went against Hadi, because that's how unpopular he was. So, in September 2014, when the, uh, the, the Houthis take over, um, the, the UN uh, helps them uh, come to a peace and national partnership agreement. This reverses the fuel price rises, price, price rises and sets a new lower price of 150 Yemeni rials per litre. Um, and this, this uh, government has actually uh, signed, this, this, this document rather, a peace and national partnership agreement document, is signed by all the major factions, including President Hadi. So the Southern Movement, the Islamis, Ansarullah, they all sign it. Um, and Ansarullah even proposes a division of, of ministries which is relatively I mean, fair. I mean, they're not even the ones that get the most. I mean, the, the GPC gets the most at night. Um, but then again, the other aspect to remember here is that um, Ansarullah took, took back control of, of... took control of Sana, not back control, took control of Sana with the support of the former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh. And that's when a lot of people became cynical and said, oh, this is just a power move by Saleh. Um, as if Saleh is the big puppet master and Ansarullah just, uh, are just puppets, you know, being pulled by, by Saleh. I mean, it's, it's obviously a very um, uh, a reductive way of looking at it, and quite insulting as well towards Ansarullah, given that Saleh is the one that waged the six wars against Ansarullah. But Ansarullah's main approach has been towards national unity national unity and dialogue, and towards ultimately um, uh, getting the Yemeni state to agree to concessions, economic concessions, and getting them to, to move against corruption. So opposing corruption is a major part of Ansarullah's objectives. So in, um, and here's the thing, it, on the 22nd of January 2015, Hadi actually resigns as president, right? So he's no longer the president. He then goes to Aden, claiming he's still president, but then the people in Aden don't like him for all the reasons I mentioned before. Then he goes to Saudi Arabia, and on the same day that he arrives in Saudi Arabia, on the 26th of March 2015, the Saudi-led coalition begins their aggression against Yemen, and they say that they're doing so on behalf of Abdul Rab Mansur Hadi. So this is what the war actually looks like, right? On the right-hand side, you have what we're told by the media is the government of Yemen. But look at the foreign allies. You've got 150,000 Saudi troops, 6,000 Sudanese, 2,100 Senegalese, 1,800 Blackwater, I think they call something else now, um, 1,500 Moroccan troops, 1,000 Qataris, 300 Bahrainis, the UAE Air Force, of course, the Kuwaiti Air Force, the Egyptian Navy. Australian refilling planes. The Australian refilling planes. Um, Australia conducted joint naval exercises to help Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia imposed the blockade on Yemen, um, and yet on the right-hand side, we're told that's the legitimate government of Yemen, and on the left-hand side, you've got the Houthi rebels. But who are the Houthi rebels? Okay. They're entirely indigenous, right? There isn't a single foreigner there. I mean, you might have a few Iranians here or there on the ground giving them technical assistance on how to, like, you know, build missiles from scratch or something like that. Um, but they've got, like, you know, the, basically what you see on the left-hand side 
is the is the uh, Yemeni Houthi state. You know, in the sense that uh, Ansarullah they fight side by side with the Yemeni National Army. Right. So the vast bulk of the Yemeni state is on the left hand side. On the right hand side, they say that they've got oh, 10,000, 20,000 <coughs> soldiers who are loyal to Hadi or something like that. But from all the evidence I can see, all they can draw upon are, are all they, the only, the only on, on the ground support that they can call upon are the Al Qaeda militias. So the United States is on the same side as Al Qaeda again. Um, but we're not told about it. Okay. Nice and multicultural, then, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Very multicultural. <laughs> But actually, it was, re was reported in the Associated Press, so just, just, read the, just read the highlighted part. To win the civil war against the Houthis, Al-Qaeda militants are effectively on the same side as the United States. There you go. Associated <laughs> Press. Um, so that's what the war looks like today. You know? So in the blue, you've got the so-called Hadi government. Actually, it's just a combination of militias. Oftentimes, those militias are killing each other um, because you've got some southern separatists, you've got... Uh, uh, Al-Qaeda militias that don't like the southern separatists, so they're killing them. You've got tribal affiliations, clashing, all that kind of stuff. This chaos in the blue areas, right? Um, but on, in, in the red areas, you've got the, the, the Houthi government holding the... You've got Ansarullah holding the Yemeni government together. As for the question of Saudi legality, I think, um, you know, Hossein and Ezi, he's from the, he's the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, he put it the best, he said, under the constitution, the law and the outcomes of the national dialogue, it is not permissible to use an external party against an internal party, and whoever does so is tried for treason. That's why Abdurrahman Mansur Hadi cannot return to Yemen because he's been sentenced to death in absentia for treason, uh, for reasons that go against the constitution, um, for reasons that, 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 are, that are in accordance with the constitution, rather. Furthermore, he says, international law does not allow any state to respond to another state's request for military intervention unless the latter is subjected to military aggression declared by a third country or several countries. Um, Saudi Arabia cannot meet those criteria. <coughs> On the left-hand side, that's the, the, um, the Al Jazeera screenshot that I took. Yemeni President Hadi under house arrest in Riyadh. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the absurdity that the media isn't talking about how absurd this is? The Saudis are bombing a country on behalf of someone they've imprisoned. Right? <laughs> <laughs> on the right hand side, that's uh, Sayyid Abdul Malik al Houthi, he's the Secretary General of Ansarullah. He starves with his people. That's a real leader for me. Okay, on the left hand side, that's, that's before the Saudi war. On the right hand side, you can see that he's been on rations just like everyone else. And then in December 2017, th these are these are some of the some of the important key events that happened um, since the Saudi intervention invasion essentially began. Um, so in December 2017, the former president who ruled for 34 years decided that he was going to switch sides and he was going to side. He was going to. So what he did was he asked the Saudis to start launching airstrikes against Ansarullah positions so that he could take back the city. Um, that didn't work. He was shot and killed. Um, no need to... No need Succinct. To. Succinct, yeah. Um, so, October 2016, um, this you may have heard about, Saudi warplanes bombed a funeral in the capital, Sana'a, killing 155 people. Um, this is just a list of their war crimes. Um, Saudi warplanes assassinated the president of the National Salvation Government of Yemen. He was in Hudayda port, so they just dropped a bomb and killed him, right? And then, when his supporters came out into the streets um, uh, to, for, his, um, for his funeral, the Saudis bombed that as well. Hmm. You know? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the level of brutality and sickness um, to do something like that? Um, in August 2018, Saudi, the Saudis bombed a school in Sada province, which is the Houthi heartland, by the way. They killed 51 people, including 40 children. Right? In, on the 10th of uh, February, um, so this year, they destroyed a truck carrying canned vegetables that had been provided by the UN World Food Program. And then they, later on, they said it was a mistake. The media didn't, didn't condemn them anywhere near as much as they should. I mean, 
I understand that some people did. Hassan bin Hajj, for example, the, the medium in the US said something. You know. Well, like, nowhere near to the extent that, 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 that this tragedy actually deserves, especially when you consider that 48% of the country is starving and they're bombing um, trucks carrying vegetables. So why the media silence, right? This is something that I've been thinking about for a very long time. Exactly. The first answer is there's no conceivable, let alone marketable, humanitarian pretext for the US-Saudi war on Yemen. Any public discussion about Yemen would lead to the question, why are the richest Arab monarchies bombing and starving the poorest Arab republic? Forget poorest Arab republic, the oldest Arab nation in the world right, is being leveled right now, because that's what Yemen is. Um, and for that, I'd have to say the structural dependence of Muslim majority nations on Saudi Arabia for remittances and aid. Um, I come from a part of India that's actually quite internationalist in terms of its <coughs> approach towards world conflicts. You know, so when Cuba um, uh, was was suffering under the sanctions during the special period and the Americans imposed a blockade and the Soviet Union was no longer there to trade with you, um, India sent twenty thousand tons of food grain. Half of that came from my state of Kerala. So they had that. They've always got an internationalist focus in my point of view. Um, when uh, the, the former Iraqi president Saddam Hussein was was hanged in 2006, um, the entire state of Kerala went on strike to protest it, not because they loved Saddam Hussein, but because out of principle, you don't go into a country and hang an Arab president, it sets a horrible precedent, that kind of thing. Um, and yet, I don't see much of, uh, I don't see even in Kerala that much of a, uh, a need, a, a sense of urgency about Yemen, and part of the reason for that is because Kerala relies on remittances from Saudi Arabia, that's the only, only major reason I can, I can think about. So, yeah, I mean, foreign, foreign powers, as I mentioned before, they've wanted to control Yemen for its strategic position. Now, when you, look at, when you look at the map of Yemen as just a strategic location, the people cease to matter, right? People don't matter, all we care is that location. All we care about is that, you know, billions of barrels of oil can flow through that strait on a daily basis. Um, this is probably one of the most uh, uh, revolting things that I, I can remember. I mean, the Yemenis, you know, sanctioned, starved. Um, they managed to, 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 to build a missile from scratch. They wanted to launch it at Jeddah, the airport uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. The reason they do this is because, well, you have to make the aggressor pay some kind of a price, you know, uh, for their aggression. And so eventually they resorted to this. How did the uh, Muslim leadership in Australia respond? Now, I'm going to say this. I mean, the Australian National Imams Council, they said, we stand in solidarity and support with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. One missile. One missile, right? And they, they, they had an entire press release. It's not just that. All over the world, right? You'll find people in India, you'll find people in Pakistan, all across the Muslim world, the Western world, you had sycophants of Saudi Arabia saying this. I remember an article against that prophecy. Is it written in English? No, I got an article and he was going to show me for information. We have some similar stories actually. I might guess we know. But please translate that article to English. That would be great. Um, <coughs> Now let's talk about the arms sales. Okay, so the biggest, biggest of the bunch is the United States, 350 billion. Can't really compete with that. Um, Britain, 13 billion. Canada, 12 billion. So the Anglo, Anglo-American alliance is basically in on this war. They see it as a, as a basically a business opportunity, a way of making money. Um, the Australian government, as as you probably know. Um, uh, released like a catalogue, an arms export catalogue, which they really wanted to split. Um, this is this is the, the one of the first parliamentary things. Oh. That's okay. That's okay. The question: How does this relate to Australia? So, Australia actually trained the Saudi Navy to impose this blockade on Yemen, and they sold weapons to Saudi Arabia. That's how it relates to Australia. Um, there was a video of I mean, Peter Wish Wilson. He got up and he, and he just couldn't believe it. He said, you know, on the one, what he said was, we, on the one hand, he said, we're, we're, we're blocking aid from reaching Yemen, even though that aid is our own aid. So Australia is effectively blocking its own aid from reaching Yemen. Right? So definitely interesting to, to watch that video where he, um, 
takes it out on Senator Maurice Payne, um, who apparently had no idea that the aid organizations that wanted to send this aid through to Yemen were sending her emails um, saying, can you please like allow us to go through, like we can see your Navy is <laughs> helping the Saudis <laughs> oppose this genocide. Um, okay, so Australia sees it as a business opportunity. This is, this is where I, I, I get angry, but I also think it's a business opportunity. That's okay, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear kind of whispers, it's like, yeah, we should do something. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so Australia wants to be a major weapons exporter, um, and to, to the credit of later Senator Alex Gallagher, um, he questioned it, he said, you know, what, what have, he asked, what have we been sending to Saudi Arabia? So at this stage, all we wanted to know is, what are we sending them, right? And the Australian government, on the one hand, they'll say, we're selling so many weapons, but then when you ask them the specific questions, who are we selling the weapons to, right? and what are we selling, they don't really want to get into it, because they know there's no justifiable humanitarian pretext for the war in Yemen, right? It's not like Syria, where you can say, oh, well, we have to arm the rebels, the government's horrible, etc., etc. There's nothing. There's nothing you can cite in Yemen to justify why you're selling those weapons. So, because the government refused to disclose which countries we were selling weapons to, to her credit, Kelly, Trant, uh, Kelly Tranter, um, she's a human rights uh, lawyer and activist. She submitted a freedom of information request, and I had a look through it. It's heavily redacted, so they're, they're still concealing a lot of information from you about what we're selling. Um, and the government ended up saying, um, what was it? Yeah, in, in, that's right. Um, in January 2018, Christopher Pine announced that electro-optic systems had struck a $410 million defense contract. Apparently $33 million um, was subsidized by the Australian taxpayer, by the way. Um, uh, but he refused to disclose who the end user was. Everyone at that time, a lot of people at that time just assumed, okay, it's probably going to the UAE for all kinds of reasons that I can get into. Um, but EOS basically said, we can't confirm or deny where it's going to, right? Um, and they couldn't confirm or deny that the UAE was the, was the end user, because remember that the UAE is also imposing this blockade on Yemen, it's not just Saudi Arabia. Um, so since March 2018, these freedom of information requests have, have revealed that there's been 37 export licenses to the UAE and 20 to Saudi Arabia, so we're making money off this, right? Um, in February 2019, the UAE confirmed that they were indeed the customer of that $410 million deal. So we had to hear it from the UAE, we couldn't hear it from our own government, you know. So, you know, when Green Senator Richard Di Natale asked Tom Hamilton, who works for the Department of Defense, if the weapons would be used in, in Yemen, you've got to read the, 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 the interaction, it's just filibustering after filibustering. Eventually he said, well, I don't know, I can't answer yes or no, I can't, can neither confirm nor deny, that kind of thing. So we don't even know if these weapons are going to be used in Yemen. But we can guess that they probably are. Um, so this is from the EOS statement. EOS products are high-end systems designed to allow our forces to engage numerically superior enemy forces. Now that describes, that vehicle describes Yemen for me per perfectly. Because it's a coward's war. You're, you're, the, the people that you're getting to fight this war against Ansarullah and the Yemeni army are uh, uh, soldiers of fortune. They're, they're, they're in it for the money, right? They're not there to die. For anything. They're there, to, they're there to kill and get paid, that's it. And so you have to send them all kinds of sophisticated gadgetry in order to protect their lives. So technology, for example, that allows a, a mounted machine gun, grenade launcher or cannon on top of a vehicle to lock onto a target while the shooter remains safely inside. Probably get a bravery award too. Probably will get a bravery award. Well, why don't they just link it up online and everybody can just do it from home? <laughs> So, um, it's not just that, I mean, also, a hundred former soldiers and federal police are being contracted by the UAE to train Emirati soldiers. Now, imagine, for example, that a hundred uh, Lebanese people who are concerned about the, the, the sovereignty of their country, they decide to go to, let's say, the south, Jnul Lebanon, south of Lebanon, um, to defend their country, right? How will they be treated by the government, right? They'll be treated as terrorists, even though I believe that they have the right to defend their country especially if it's against Israeli aggression. Um, 
But in the case of these hundred former soldiers and federal police going over to UAE, participating in an actual genocide for which there's no humanitarian pretext, no, who cares? This is the, the level of morality that we've, that we've sunk to, unfortunately, in this country. And, um, yeah, I mean, this, this guy at the bottom, he said that about 50% of the, the, the foreign military contractors are Australian. That is, the people training the UAE. Okay, that's the, that's the horrible stuff. Now for some, some good stuff. I don't like to use the word good for a conflict like this, but you've got to be grateful for some things. I mean, in September 2018, Spain cancelled um, uh, the, their arms sales to Saudi Arabia because they said, look, you're just inflicting too much of a heavy death toll. We don't want to be a part of it. Um, Maurice Payne, by comparison, on the 20th of Feb this year, she says, look, you know, it's under review about whether or not Australia will impose a ban on weapons to Saudi Arabia. So that's why I say we should make this an election issue. And those of you who are interested, I'd be, very, I'd, be, I'd be keen on talking to you about this. Because surely it's not a very hard thing to sell that we should not be participating in the genocide committed by Saudi Arabia, which is already one of the most hated countries in the world. I mean, they chopped up that Jamal Khashoggi guy, you know, so... He's already hated. The, the, the government of Saudi Arabia is already hated. Um, and more recently, the US Senate and Congress voted to end US support for the Saudi-led coalition um, on the grounds that the United States, according to Bernie Sanders, should not be supporting a catastrophic war led by a despotic regime. I agree wholeheartedly. Finally, I mentioned earlier before that I no longer have Tim Anderson as my supervisor. The reason for that is because uh, Sydney University considers um, uh, <laughs> considered that image. He made an image, um, which is like really, really obscure, where like like uh, an Israeli flag is altered slightly to look like a swastika. They said, "Disrespectful, offensive. You're out. You're sacked." Um, what they don't find disrespectful and offensive, however, is is uh, investing in the very arms companies that are selling weapons to Saudi Arabia and are currently imposing the blockade on Yemen. I mean, the Chancellor of Sydney University, Belinda Hutchinson, is also the chairwoman of Tullus Australia. And Tullus Australia, not, not oh. Tullus as a global corporation, they're the ones that build the Sawadi 2 enabled uh, vessels that are, that are currently imposing the, the Saudi UAE blockade on Yemen. Then you've got the Provost and Deputy uh, Vice-Chancellor, uh, Dr. Stephen Gartley. He's on the board of the United States Study Center, which is a privately funded body at UCID. They receive donations from Raytheon, which is a company that sells guided missiles to Israel. Mm -hmm. right? So when, I'm just saying, like, just the way it looks, right? When, when they got rid of Tim Anderson, I, I wasn't surprised. I really wasn't. Um, and according to documents released uh, in March last year, um, Sydney University has four million invested in arms manufacturing corporations. So all of that hex debt that you get, I mean, where does it go? Where does it get invested in? That should be a conversation that we start having, especially if we're students and we're giving money to these institutions. Okay, so <clears throat> to finish up, uh, Yemen is an absolute human tragedy. We are watching. Uh, one of, the, one of the most ancient civilizations in the world being, being pummeled before our eyes. And the reason why we're not talking about it is because A, we benefit from it, and B, because Saudi Arabia has that much influence over global affairs because of the oil, ultimately. Mm. Um, so I think this is something that we should get active about. It's going to be difficult. I mean, one of the things about the Syrian war that worked in our favor is that the government was constantly demonizing the Syrian government. Well, in the sense that we can make an issue out of it, because if, if, if the, the corporate media, rather, is demonizing the Syrian government, then it gives us an opportunity to hit back. But if the corporate media is saying very little to nothing about Yemen, then it's very difficult for people to kind of realize that anything's going on, right? So we, we're in this, in this strange situation as anti-war um, uh, people and activists where it's almost as if, if you look at that previous slide, that, the, that what we traditionally call bourgeois politicians are more are being swayed simply by, um, uh, by the actions of Saudi Arabia without actually having to concede anything to a local anti-war movement. Because the anti-war movement, let's be honest, it's been dead ever since the invasion of Iraq. Invasion of Iraq, a million people uh, marched against that. Invasion of Syria, 
well, you know, the vast majority of the left took a side against us, and then when it came time to defend Yemen, pretty much no one on the left is interested in caring about war anymore. There's all these other issues that matter, you know, BuzzFeed issues that matter for the left, rather than war and imperialism, and, and, and I'm hoping we can change that. Um, so I leave you with my website, theorientaldesktop.com. A lot of the information that I told you here today you can find there. I've written um, six articles about Yemen so far.